William Cassidy, Ann Cassidy, Patricia Cassidy, Beverly Jaros, Cynthia Anderson, Andrea Dennis, Aaron DeMarco, Kyle Rollin, Alan Schlesman, Christine Wilson, Jessica Minter, Vicki Koch, and Nancy Eagleson. These are the cases Eye on Justice has featured thus far. The stories of the victims are always intense, and the journey to the truth can be a heartbreaking experience. But when the cases involve children, the emotions can be overwhelming. Here are four more faces, four more souls. Each of them were only here for a short time, yet their lives and deaths continue to impact us. Over 13,000 children are murdered in the United States every year. These four children will forever be a part of that statistic. May we never forget their faces or what happened to them. Before we begin this episode, I just want to take a moment to thank all of those who have subscribed to my channel and helped Eye on Justice reach its first milestone of over 900 subscribers. I've enjoyed hearing from all of you in the comments and look forward to bringing you many more cold cases. Michael Dean Klitsch, age 12. Michael was murdered on June 28th 1971 in Galena, Ohio, Delaware County. Michael, who was from the Grandview Heights area of Ohio, was a sports enthusiast. His father, Richard Klitsch, was a tennis pro, so little wonder that tennis was one of Michael's favorite sports, followed up with swimming and baseball. Whatever the sport, Michael was always ready to join the team. At 2 p.m. on June 28, 1971, Michael told his mother he was going to the local tennis courts not far from his home to practice his serve for an upcoming tournament. Before he left, his mother told him she would pick him up at around 3.30 p.m. to take him to a swim club. When his mother arrived at the tennis courts at 3.40 p.m., Michael was nowhere to be found. Shortly after a quick search, Mrs. Klitsch notified authorities that Michael was missing. Authorities were to be on the lookout for 12-year-old Michael Dean Klitsch. Brown hair, blue eyes, wearing horn-brimmed glasses. He was wearing an aqua sweater with a white stripe around the collar and sleeves. Tan shorts, white socks, and white tennis shoes with a black stripe. 24 hours after Michael went missing, his father Richard was quoted as saying, Michael may have been too adventuresome, but he had an all-important baseball game last night, which he dearly loved and wouldn't have missed. The search for Michael went on for two weeks with no sightings of the 12-year-old. Then on July 11th at 7.45 p.m., George Hall and his family were out picking berries in a rural area of Delaware County, just 30 minutes from where Michael went missing. The family happened upon an old tool shed just off a seldom used path and looked inside. That's when they discovered the remains of a body. Authorities were hampered in their investigation because of the condition of the decomposed body, which was charred in an attempt to burn it. A pair of glasses and fragments of blue and tan clothing were used to ID the remains. The Klitsch's optician confirmed the glasses belonged to Michael, and his parents confirmed the pieces of clothing matched what Michael was wearing when he went missing. 
Dr. Noba Hisababa confirmed in the autopsy report that Michael died of multiple deep stab wounds. There were at least 10 stab wounds to his chest. Dr. Baba said some wounds were administered vertically and horizontally. There was no pattern to the stabbings. The weapon was a single-edge thin blade longer than four inches. Most likely, the weapon was a butcher knife. Because the body was partially burned, Dr. Baba was unable to determine if Michael had been sexually molested. The tool shed was only six feet by six feet. Officers believe the killing took place someplace else and then Michael was put in the shed because there was no blood found and no sign of a struggle. Delaware County Deputy William Lavery said the boy had no known enemies and the only possible motive appeared to be a sex crime. Lavery went on to say that the obscurity of the place where the corpse was dumped indicated the murderer was familiar with the area. Upon further investigation of the area where Michael's body was found, investigators were able to find two lighter fluid cans and Michael's tennis racket and shoes in an open dump just south of the shed. All evidence, along with a scorched wall board and a piece of flooring from the shed, were turned over to the FBI. After 51 years, Michael's case remains unsolved. What happened the day he went missing is a mystery, and we are left to speculate. The temperatures that day in June were over 80 degrees, so did the adventuresome Michael decide to accept a ride from a stranger instead of waiting for his mother? Or perhaps a child predator who may have lived in the apartment building close to the tennis courts saw a perfect opportunity to snatch a little boy. Michael's parents found his tennis ball near one of the courts that day and said that he would have never left his ball behind. So was Michael practicing his serve and then lured away to innocently walk into the hands of a killer. Michael could have grown up to one day play at Wimbledon. He could have been an Olympic swimmer or a professional baseball player. But instead, on a horrible day in June of 1971, all of these possibilities were savagely taken away from him. Mackenzie Taylor Branham, age 8. Mackenzie was murdered on April 27, 2006 in Jeffersonville, Ohio. This case is full of intrigue. There are more questions than answers, and it's riddled with failure to bring Mackenzie's killer to justice. Here is what we know about this sweet little girl. Mackenzie was a straight-A student and a happy child who always had a big smile on her face. Her parents were separated, and she had recently went to stay with her mother and her mother's boyfriend before she was murdered. At 2 a.m. on April 27, 2006, the Jeffersonville Township Fire Department responded to a house fire at 7 East Walnut Street. The two-story structure was engulfed in flames. Mackenzie's mother, Mary Branham's truck, was found in the street running with its doors open. Both Mary and her boyfriend, Kenneth Mossbarger, escaped the home without injury. Firemen remember Mary was located on a neighbor's porch across the street when they arrived. A fireman moved Mary's truck so they could get in to fight the fire. The first responders reported that Mary Branham didn't tell them that Mackenzie was in the burning home until 15 to 20 minutes after their arrival. Mackenzie's corner bedroom was located on the second floor. She was found face down on her bed. The flames never engulfed her body and she was alive when the smoke got to her. Her cause of death was listed as acute carbon monoxide toxicity due to inhalation of products of combustion. After a thorough investigation, the blaze was declared a result of arson. 
an accelerant was used in an explosion that started in the foyer of Mackenzie's home. Her death was officially declared a homicide. Mackenzie's father, Donald Branham, began his own investigation into his daughter's murder, seeking justice for his little girl. The following details were uncovered. Montgomery County Coroner's Office report from investigator Jim Fannin states that vaginal, rectal, and oral swabs taken from the decedent tested positive for semen. The identity of the person who the DNA belongs to is unknown. Mackenzie's father was never told about the sexual assault until 11 years after her death. Three months after her death, Upon the request of Fayette County Coroner Dr. Albert Gay, Mackenzie's wet and partially burned clothes that she had been wearing at the time of her death were destroyed. Gay felt that they held little significance to the case. Notes Dr. Gay made after responding to the scene of the fire went missing from Mackenzie's case file, only to reappear years later. The file included a description of the crime scene and statements about what happened to Mackenzie. The original investigator on the case and Fayette County Coroner Dr. Albert Gay are now both deceased, so there will never be a full explanation of why Mackenzie's clothes were destroyed and why her sexual assault was kept hidden. Sheriff Vernon Stanforth had this to say, My investigators never had a chance to inspect the clothing. I'm disappointed we didn't have the option, but there is nothing that we can do now. Now it's about finding that missing piece. The hurt of losing a child is immeasurable, and we are in contact with a father on a regular basis. We are not giving up. Eleven years after Mackenzie's rape and murder, the Sheriff's Department exhumed her body to look for further DNA in hopes of discovering what led up to her death. Mackenzie's father continues to ask the questions that haunt him the most. Who sexually assaulted his little girl? Who set fire to the house? And why were her clothes destroyed and not preserved for further testing? Donald Branham's remark to a reporter said it best. The perpetrator still walks among us. I personally don't want a child to go through what my Mackenzie did. Brandon Lamar Beidelman, age 18 months. Brandon was murdered September 13, 1981. Adorable Brandon could only say a few words. He was learning to walk without holding on to his mother's hand. He had his favorite cup that he drank from and his favorite toys that he played with. Brandon was the apple of his mother's eye. And then a simple stop for groceries would suddenly end both their lives. On the afternoon of September 13, 1971, 21-year-old Janice Beidelman dropped off her husband Stanley at a friend's house. Stanley gave his wife a kiss, not knowing that this would be the last time he would see her and his son Brandon alive. He told Janice that he loved her and then watched as they drove away. Janice and Brandon spent the rest of the day stopping in to see friends and visiting with relatives. Later in the evening, Janice phoned her husband to tell him that she was stopping to pick up a few groceries and then heading back home. Relatives reported later that Janice put Brandon in the back seat of her orange 1974 Vega and waved goodbye. Authorities believe that Janice and Brandon may have stopped at a grocery store on Cleveland Avenue. The assailant or assailants may have overtaken Janice in the parking lot, forcing her into her car and then driving off with her and Brandon. Authorities found some of Janice's jewelry and other items in that area. 
witnesses that lived near Egler Bridge, said they observed a car driving with its headlights off down an access road next to the bridge. They also recall hearing the muffled cries of a woman and a baby in a male voice. When Janice and the baby failed to arrive home, Stanley and his family began searching for them. At around 12 p.m. on the 14th of September, Stanley notified authorities that his wife and child were missing. The officer took some notes and told Stanley he would contact him as soon as he learned something. At 1.20 p.m. that same day, Janice and Brandon's bodies were discovered in a ravine on the far north side of Columbus near her abandoned car. Janice was found nude. She had been raped, beaten, and strangled to death. She was lying on her back in a foot of water in Alum Creek. Brandon was found face up 50 yards downstream under a bridge. Brandon had been suffocated with his own pillow. For 41 years, the deaths of baby Brandon and his mother Janice have remained unsolved. The only case authorities thought might have been linked to the Beidelman case was that of Georgia Page, a retiree who had been found in her upstairs bedroom strangled with a piece of cloth on the same day as the Beidelman murders. What happened to Janice Beidelman was absolutely horrific. I can only imagine the fear and anguish she must have experienced, knowing that not only would she lose her own life, but Brandon's as well. He was a child, a baby, an innocent soul. What could have provoked an individual to commit this truly horrific and heinous act? Marvin Lee King, age 12. Marvin was murdered on January 25, 1973, in Springfield, Ohio. Marvin, or Bo as his mother affectionately referred to him, was an outgoing, friendly boy who oftentimes was too trusting. Bo lived with his mother Monica King in the Rose Garden Mobile Home Park, and his father Henry King resided in Florida. Bo's classmates remember the thin, freckle faced boy fondly. He looked like a blonde alfalfa from the Little Rascals always had a smile on his face, and was one of the nicest kids we knew. On Thursday, January 25, 1973, Bo's mother Monica was working at a local bar called The Bonfire. She remembers Bo calling her during the evening, but the bar was pretty busy, so she told him that she would call him back. When she finally got a break, Monica called Bo, but didn't get an answer. Mother's intuition told Monica that something was wrong, so she sent a friend to the trailer to check on Bo. Monica's friend found the front door ajar. Stepping inside, the friend could see that Bo had been baking cookies. After a brief search, Monica's friend reported back to her that Bo wasn't at home. Alarmed by what her friend had told her, Monica left work early and went door to door in the trailer court to see if neighbors had seen her son. Some neighbors said they spoke with him but didn't remember anything out of the ordinary during their conversation. One neighbor remembered Bo saying he might go to the grocery store. Another reported seeing Bo get into a dark car, possibly a 65 Chevy or Pontiac. Monica, now frantic, notified authorities that her son was missing at 11.30 p.m. The following day, January 26, the search for Bo continued. Only now, authorities were dealing with other mysterious details of the case. An anonymous caller started placing calls that afternoon and evening to the Springfield News Sun, to the St. Mary's School, a church, and the last one to the Sheriff's Department at 9.45 p.m. These phone calls spoke of a man's body in a ditch along West Possum Road. Following the directions from these phone calls, 
Sheriff Harold M. Mills and several of his deputies began their search. According to the anonymous caller, the body was seen from the road. However, the search by the officers took them much deeper into the field. Bo was discovered in a shallow ditch behind a tree. Sheriff Mills said the location of the body would have been nearly impossible to be seen from the road. The sheriff said Bo was completely clothed except his jacket was missing. Deputies were searching the area for the boy's three-quarter length brown coat with an imitation fur collar. Sheriff Mills said Bo had been dead for at least 12 to 16 hours. His cause of death was strangulation. It's believed that the killer used a nylon clothesline or an appliance cord. Bo was not molested, but may have been killed in a different location and his body dumped in the field. The only person of interest in Bo's case was a 35-year-old Springfield man who had been in the Clark County Jail for almost a month on a morals charge in another case. Authorities were unable to connect the man to Bo's murder. It's been 49 years since Bo's murder, and the Sheriff's Department has lost contact with Bo's mother, Monica, decades ago. Monica was from England, so it's not known if she is still here in the States or has returned home. Law enforcement has continued to look for Bo's killer the monster who strangled him on a cold winter's night in January and dumped him in an icy field. On the 40th anniversary of Bo's murder, Clark County Sheriff had this to say, There are things that haunt you. This was a child who was just left out there, and no child deserves to die like that. Some of the most heinous crimes that are ever committed are those against children. They trust us to protect them and never hurt them. Every child is a ray of hope, love, joy, and light until someone decides to extinguish them. If you have any information about the crimes committed against these children, please call the numbers on your screen now. Thank you for joining me today. As always, if you enjoy this type of content and support what we do here at Ion Justice, please like, subscribe, and hit that notification bell so that you never miss a video. Also, comment your thoughts and feelings on these four horrific cases. Until I see you again, stay well and be safe. This has been Ion Justice.